Thank you, Richard. Yes, that's, that's, that's one of my prides and joy, that one. I, they also made me a Cossack, believe it or not, an honorary Cossack, where I had to uh, dance with some interestingly clad uh, Cossack ladies and swim naked in the River Don. Uh, so, you know, all these accolades come, come at, at, at a significant price. I'm just going to start off my little Gucci little timer here, so I'll try and keep the time. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so Bob Stone is my name. Yeah, I, I actually re officially retired in July, so I'm currently an emeritus uh, in between jobs. And allegedly, the university is going to offer me a part-time position to come back and carry on the work of the team. I've got two of my colleagues here, Vishen Gary and, and, and Manso, who um, I've, I've also got uh, some quotes from, from the uh, systematic review, systematic study he's been doing recently. The focus of the talk is please remember the human. Now, I don't, I'm hopefully not going to offend people in this lecture with some of the things I'm going to say, but I have been doing this for like 33 years now, and I carry all the mental and physical scars of being involved in VR, AR, and more recently, mixed reality, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, but so I, I was quite, I was a bit, little bit ill at ease last night when people came up to me and said, you're, the, you're that Bob Stone on LinkedIn, aren't you? You're the one who's always slagging off people and slagging off technology, which I do. Um, I have two, two, two aims first thing in the, in the morning, is, every morning. Is number one is to have a coffee. Number two is to, not purposely, but I find myself doing it, upsetting people on LinkedIn. Um, and the reason I do that is not because I'm trolling or, 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 or being nasty. It's because some of the things that we see in virtual augmented reality you know, today, I've seen it all before. In the 1990s and 2000s, I'll go back to this in just a minute. And, Lessons have not been learned and things haven't changed. There's enormous opportunity in this, in this field, particularly throughout healthcare, not just surgery, but rehabilitation, mental and physical. We'll show you some of the things we're doing a little bit later on. But everyone seems to think that putting on a headset is what it's all about. The wow, the Gucci white headset, the wow effect, and it's not. Um, and, and hopefully I'm going to explain why I'm so vehemently anti some of the things we see on, online. To do that, I've got to take you back to the, the early 1990s. So I started this courtesy of a chance experience over at NASA uh, in California, and that changed my career. But in the early 1990s, when VR was just about to hit the UK, it had been going for a few years before that in the US, is that everyone started getting excited about virtual reality and healthcare and the surgical room of the future, for example. So you see everything from flying through vascular systems to people in headsets being able to see transparent images through, through bodies for training. Um, the Stanford picture on the bottom right-hand corner there of every piece, that, let's just chuck every piece of technology at that poor ophthalmic surgeon in the hope that he'll be able to do a little bit better job at removing a cataract. And again, this is something that we, we, we see all too often even today, and I'll show some update examples in a minute. But back in the 1990s, we too got very excited about it. I, we were so proud of that 3D stomach, you would not believe it. So there we have, a, I hope you can see the video, it's a, it's, it's a conversion of a conversion of a VHS. So we were able to go build this 3D model of a stomach and fly through it. And you know, that for us, and then we, we did the same with some lungs and, and some 3D ribs and some hearts and stuff. And we, and we were putting people in headsets and putting them in gloves so you could point where you were looking, you could fly around the body. Great, great fun. Uh, it was great, great fun. But at the same time, there was another technology that was causing issues throughout the medical fraternity, and that was keyhole surgery laparoscopic cholecystectomy. It was getting extraordinarily bad press. And it was getting bad press because individuals were being trained inadequately with inappropriate technology, and then being allowed to operate on individuals uh, who are undergoing keyhole surgery, both sort of lap coli gynecology, for example. And uh, the problem was they didn't have any way of objectively measuring the capabilities of the trainees when they came out of, of, of training. So at that time, the National Health Service and the Wolfson Foundation set up three, well, actually four, four uh, uh, minimally invasive therapy centers across the UK. Um, London, I think it was Imperial, Dundee, and Leeds. And they also came to Manchester. Um, and they came to Manchester to help us set up what was called the Wolfson Center for minimally invasive therapy. Not to do general training, but to look at how this thing called virtual reality might stress, might improve the lot, the lot of ch surgical trainees in the future. And this is what they were. This is what they were training with, and this is the problem I've just mentioned. So you had basic, your dolly mixtures for basic training inside one of these Epicon endo boxes. You had intermediate skills training, which are grapes. Grapes are great because if you squeeze them too hard, they splat, and you can peel them off the stalks. And then your advanced trainer was chicken. So you actually peel, you actually peel the chicken skin off quite deftly using these laparoscopic instruments. Um, that's and these things were used when the 
the, the, the product, the, the, the foam substrate with the balloons for the gallbladder and the, stra the red straws for the vascular systems have worn out and you couldn't afford to replace them because they were so incredibly expensive. So 1994 to 2003, we set up the, uh, the Wilson Center for minimally invasive surgery at Manchester Royal uh, Infirmary with a good friend and colleague of mine, gastrointestinal surgeon called uh, Rory McCloy. And over the years, uh, we looked into a whole wide range of, of, of techniques within virtual reality uh, to help possibly train the, 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 uh, the surgeons of the future. And that's where I made my first mistake. Nobody's perfect, and I may be critical on LinkedIn, but my God, did we make a huge mistake. You know, we, we saw all this stuff being advertised at conferences and in brochures and what have you, and we, we, we just said, yes, we've just got to use this tech. The surgeons definitely need this tech, don't they? And, and, and the surgeons who are just as bad when it comes to gimmicks. We're, we're completely in agreement. So we had a quarter of a million pound graphics supercomputer being enabling us to actually deform tissue uh, in a way that the surgeons hated. They didn't, they didn't, they, there was no way that they were going to su subscribe to this degree of tissue deformation, even though we were using this fantastic graphics supercomputer. We had top left-hand corner, auto stereoscopic display. It's a display that, dis that displays stereo without the use of any form of glassware whatsoever because yeah, you're, you're, you're operating in quite complex, um, overlapping structures. Of course the surgeons need stereo, don't they? It's, it's, it's obvious. And haptic feedback, force and touch feedback. We spent an awful lot of time designing and then building that rather Heath Robinson looking device so that we could actually feel tissue, we could feel vascular beating, we could feel all kinds of effects inside a small volume. Because of course the surgeons need haptic feedback, don't they? Uh, when they're actually carrying out these, uh, these, these tiny little operations, these, these, these tiny operations within the area that the calyx triangle or within the, the, the area around the gallbladder and the liver. And when we, did, when we, when we did featured this, having really been smug and happy with ourselves, we were torn to pieces, absolutely torn to pieces. There's no way on God's earth they said you could afford a quarter million pound supercomputer. There's no way that we're going to believe that, that tissue deformation is doing, is doing the kind of thing you'd find when you, open, when you actually carry out open surgery, never known keyhole surgery. Um, we don't have stereo because we just look at a standard monitor. In, in, in theater, we just got a standard two-dimensional TV screen. And as for haptic feedback, 50-50. Some surgeons said, yes, we definitely need it. Some surgeons said not. Um, but most of them really want to be able to hold objects accurately in a very, very small volume. So we'd forgotten the basics. And these are the basics. This is what I, teach, what I have been teaching to my students in our Human Factors courses at Birmingham. The basics as advocated by a variety of people, but my favorite, simply because it's a, it's a fantastic book, it's been going for decades, uh, is The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. And again, not wanting to lecture on this, but what we were doing was fundamentally this. And it matters not whether the world is real or, or virtual, it's whenever you introduce any form of technological barrier between you and the world, you would then encourage these two, what he called gulf of execution and gulf of evaluation to appear. The gulf of evaluation means that the technology barrier that you're putting between yourself and the task is influencing the way in which you perceive the task, influencing the way in which you make cognitive judgments about what you're going to be doing next. As soon as you put a barrier in between you and actually carrying out actions on the task, the effect or the actions on the task, you then got this gulf of execution issue. So for example, if you introduce gloves, virtual reality gloves, which are horrendous even today, or haptic feedback systems that don't work, then you are compromising your ability to carry out the, carry out the, the actual uh, skills that are necessary to complete that task. So you've got this vicious circle. And that's what we were doing. We were introducing all this technology without realizing what it was that the surgeons or the surgical trainees actually needed. And this was, this was a, a, the fundamental error on my part. Uh, having been qualified, I mean, I've got, I've got a master's degree in ergonomics, so that we shouldn't have done this, but we were, we were wowed by the technology and wowed by the claims that people were making about this technology. So we went back into the theater, and I spent four days or four afternoons uh, in the theater with, uh, with Rory McCloy, my colleague, just observing uh, what he was doing and what his team was doing and what instruments they were using, looking at the conditions of the patients. And we were doing our, basically an observational task analysis, which human factors people are trained to do. Like, it's, it's bread and butter to us. And we're looking at what was it that modifying the task? What, what, what constraints were the instruments putting on the surgeon? What was the sequence of events that the surgeon had to go through to insufflate the body, then carry out the penetration, then carry out things like diathermy? What about task modifiers, for example, in terms of how close you're standing to your, next, your, your, your surgical assistant? You know, what's, what's, what context are you working in? Is it a tight, is it a very small operating room or is it a large one? And so on and so forth. But we identified all these different features. 
And in particular, we came across um, a number of tasks. Uh, really, we were able to identify six individual lap coli tasks. And one, when we were working with, I was working with Alan Farthing when he was at St. Mary's. He was, you know, he's, he's, the, he's, he's the Royal Gynecologist now, so he's really, he's really made, it, uh, made it well. So we did um, six laparoscopic cholestectomy tasks and one gynecological task um, that we, we were able to identify something that we call sort of psychomotor primitives, psychomotor uh, sort of task primitives. So I, can't go, I won't go through all, all six tasks, you'll probably fall asleep. So I put task six, which is the most difficult, which involves holding a piece of tissue accurately, bringing the diathermy probe, stopping a bleeding, or, or actually carrying out some degree of cutting. Uh, that, took, that, that was actually the most complex in terms of accuracy and patient safety that we identified during a lap coli uh, investigation. The gynecological task was, again, holding something accurately in, the, in, a, in a small 3D volume, and then using the diathermy probe to actually carry out burning to cut the tissue in a, in a very accurate linear fashion. So we were able to take those six tasks and break them down into what we call these psychomotor primitives. Grasp, maintain, maintain handling, exchange, exchange in terms of moving um, ob objects around or moving your instruments around, um, using both instruments, taking instruments out, changing them for other instruments, and also things like depressing the foot pedals, because the foot pedal was depressed to apply current to the end of the diathermy probe. So again, this is bog standard human factors stuff that we do, that we now do all the time. Um, and we were able, as, as a result of that, to decompose these very complex tasks into very similar, it's a very simple primitive. So this is task one, which is literally holding an object accurately in 3D space. If you moved outside the volume, that, that volume, it was an error, and we were recording errors. We were recording motion economy. We were recording uh, contact errors. Uh, we had task three, hopefully. Here we are, task three, which was, again, this idea of using the instruments to step over tissue, to alternately step over a piece of tissue, as we, as we were seeing in the gynecological uh, intervention, and moving along, for, for example, the cystic duct. Task six, which is the most complicated one, this involves, let's say, actually handling an object. When it goes into the, into the, into the cube, you'll see three little, some of you will be able to see the three little red boxes appear. You withdraw the instrument, bring the diaphragmy probe back in, depress the foot pedal, and then you, without penetrating into the blue sphere, you try to simulate in a simulated fashion burn that little red box off. If you push too far, you sort of transgressed into the, into the sphere that was all classified as errors. But we were recording everything that the surgical training was doing, and we were coming up with objective measures. Here's the gynecological example I told you. So again, holding something accurately in a space, and then using the diaphragmy probe to literally follow that red line and, 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 and remove the red in as accurately as you can without, in, without actually penetrating further into the tissue. And that was hugely successful. This resulted in something called MIST, Minimally Invasive Surgical Trainer. Uh, sorry to our German colleagues. So I, know, I know MIST in German means something completely different, but this, this, is, it, it, this is what it stood for. And this is also an example, an early example, of what we call mixed reality. Now, mixed reality is not about headsets. Microsoft loved calling the HoloLens mixed reality headset. It's not. It's an augmented reality headset. Mixed reality is all about the interface and content. So on the bottom right-hand corner, we've got um, instrumented instruments, if you like. These are instruments that, will, that, that, that record the movements of the hand. Uh, and even though they're not seeing physiologically or anatomically accurate information, that brings a degree of credibility to the fact that they're using these very simple objects in order to hone their skills, in order to, for example, realize that if you move your instrument to the right or to, or, or to, the, or to the left, that what you see on screen is the opposite. It's called the fulcrum effect. So we're training basic skills. We're not training them to recognize gallbladder, cystic duct, mesentery, liver. We're actually teaching the skills they need to graduate from open surgery to, to, um, to laparoscopic cholestectomy. And as a result of that, it, it, this got so much support in terms of universities across the globe, of the US, um, Ireland, uh, UK, and uh, continental Europe, uh, particularly in, in, in Germany, uh, that not only did it become the de facto trainer at the Ethicon Endo, uh, Endosurgery Training Institute in Hamburg for 10 years, it was also on sale uh, from 1997 to about 2010. And I'm afraid my, um, my previous chief executive uh, sold, the, sold the division off and I never got a penny, but that's, not, that's the way life goes. Uh, but nevertheless, it has, it has matured since then. It, 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 if you now go to um, Mentis, based in Sweden, you'll see that they have introduced anatomy and you have introduced phys physiology. But that was testament. That was testament to a strong human-centered design, human factors approach from the very start. Yes, we made, we, we made serious mistakes. Yes, we lost, we lost quite a lot of money, almost lost the contract completely, but we were able to pull it back with just four half days 
of being in, in, a, in a surgical situation with a specialized, with a specialized surgeon. And what did we really learn? Well, we certainly learned from the very early days that so-called, this thing they call immersion using VR headsets is not a prerequisite for effective training. And that's as, that's as meaningful today as it was back then. And trying to, uh, try, trying to, to strive for the greatest level of fidelity or realism in training is also not a prerequisite for effective training. So simply assuming, of course, that the interactive technology is, is bound to work, again, it, that, that's, that's just foolhardy, uh, even today, if you believe what you see on, on LinkedIn or YouTube or whatever, you're going to be in trouble. And developing VR solutions without um, a sound, human-centered approach is also foolhardy. Again, we, we've learned that uh, at our cost. And then finally, uh, but equally important, involving specialists, subject matter experts, stakeholders, members of staff, not just at the beginning, but all the way through a de design process is also absolutely crucial. Getting the test every step of the way to make sure that you're not taking, making assumptions about the kind of content that they need to interact with and the technology that they will be interacting it with. There were equally other uh, projects where we applied exactly the same approach and did come up with a fairly, not, not necessarily hugely expensive, but technologically based solution. So this is uh, a European project looking at temporal bone surgery. Uh, and at the, uh, the end of the, the human factors analysis, we decided that yes, the surgeons do need stereoscopic vision because they're looking into a microscope or a binocular, um, microscope, binocular instrument when they're carrying out mastoidectomy. And therefore, that's because they need to look at physical structures, particularly if they're trying to avoid the sigma sinus, sigma sinus, or for example, the facial nerve. As they're getting deeper and deeper into the mastoid, uh, they need to be able to see in 3D within these volumes. But the important thing was, yes, they did need haptics. So at the time, we were using one of the early phantom uh, haptic feedback systems, which is still you know, a fabulous piece of kit for things like dentist training or, or, or bone, drilling, bone drilling or bone burring. Uh, and the, the great thing about this, this particular piece of kit, which is literally just a joystick, which is being back-driven by windscreen wiper motors, would you believe, not only did it give you the sense that you were drilling through, th dr drilling through tissue, as long as you didn't push too hard, because th there are certain limitations with this tech, but it also made the noise. So you actually simulate the noise of going through different densities of bone. So that was giving them both the haptic and the sound cue. And for that reason, it was, uh, it, it, the, the actual study was, was very successful. But again, because of the cost and because of the, 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 the limitations, you could, and the fact that we couldn't push these drilling things to extreme, it never took off commercially. So more lessons learned there. And then more recently, a, a, a few years ago, well, actually it's probably about 10 years ago now, I suppose, we, we teamed up with a Leamington Spa-based uh, games company um, which was a bit of a mistake, unfortunately, because no matter how much we tried to talk to them about using human-centered design to design tasks for surgeons who had no experience of battlefield situations, no experiences of extreme trauma, who were being sent out to our Iraq and Afghanistan, no matter how much we tried to tell them, they insisted on putting in things because they could. So, for example, at one stage in this demonstration, there's a fly that flies into the tent and lands on the guy's chest. Why? There's all kinds of different... I mean, some of my favorites... Yeah, this is great. You know, they, they had to put physics into the stethoscope. They just had to. Well, what's, the, what's the tube of the stethoscope? Whoa, what's that thing go? Yeah. And then again, well, it's like, and the surgeons, you know, surgeons aren't silly people. They notice this. They notice problems with the dynamics. They notice the fact that, you, you know, there's, well, I guess, and this is another one. And this laryngoscope reflection, something called environment mapping. Just make the laryngoscope nice and shiny because it's really shiny in real life. But then, Let's get the reflections wrong. So the reflections in that laryngoscope are of the nurse and the, bo the bottom half of the patient. So you can, you, can do, I mean, make it, you can see the patient's chest, his nipples. You can see the nurse. The reflection's actually wrong. And the surgeons are picking up on that. And it, we found that because they were, the, the, the surgeons were going through this and saying, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, they were losing one and a half minutes out of a four and a half minute simulated life-saving life -saving, uh, intervention, which is absolutely crazy. So again, Another lesson learned, if you're ever working with games companies, tie them down, whip them, beat them. Do, not let them. do not let them put things into their games because they can. This isn't Call of Duty. It's not Half-Life 3, or whatever the next version of Half-Life is. It's a serious game, so-called. But don't put things in just because you've got the software and you've got the capability to do it, because it's distracting. It's, it's unnecessary. What we used to call hyper-fidelity, hyper it's just too distracting. But here we go. Um, this, is, this is where I become unpopular, probably here and on LinkedIn, but we still see things like this. So here we have one of the latest um, laparoscopic cholecystectomy trainers, 
and you've got somebody in a headset inside an operating theater looking at a screen, when all they really need to do is look at the screen. You've got, I'm not too sure how they're actually controlling these laparoscopic instruments. It's, 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 it's probably, it's, it, looks as if it's, uh, it looks as if it's some kind of instrumented haptic feedback type solution. Fine, that's great. But look around, I mean, there's, there's nothing else happening in that operating theater. The support staff, the scrub nurse, the other, the other individuals are they're just standing there, motionless. They're, they're, not, they're not contributing to the task performance at all. It's absolutely crazy. So again, think about the barriers that you're injecting. Think about the barriers you're putting into the scene. Into the scene. Are, you really, are you really going to be giving these guys the right skills to transfer from the virtual to the real? Is it going to affect their, their skill fade, for example? Or if, because they've had this experience in VR, will their skills be as good three months down the line as they were the, the hour or so afterwards? Factor fiction, lots of factor fiction. I've, I, I used to collect these. I used to collect these regularly off, off, off LinkedIn. These pictures where, where groups and companies are using basically very good computer-generated imagery videos to show the concept of what happens when you put on a whole lens, or you put on a magic leap, or you put on any form of headset or AR headset for that matter. And they are so misleading; it's unbelievable. Now. Again, with apologies to our good friends down the corridor, I, I don't like the HoloLens. If you put the HoloLens in and you use it in, well, first of all, you don't use it outside. So all these claims in the States that the American Army is using it are rubbish, because once you take it outside in the sunshine, you can't see anything. If you actually use it in an operating theater, uh, the chances are because the, both the, uh, the, the ambient and direct light, the direct lighting will just completely do veiling glare, wash out the imagery on what is already a really small um, 52 degrees field of view in the case of the new HoloLens 2. So what do they do? They don't want to show you the pictures through the HoloLens or, or the Magic Leap. They'll show you these, these, these rather glitzy videos instead. Very, very misleading and a source of serious disappointment to anyone who ends up buying them. Here's one of my favorites. I'm not too sure why this guy suddenly stood up almost Lazarus-like and, 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 and is, is walking around on top of the, uh, the operating table. Uh, but this, this, this guy wanted to show off this, this model as a, as, a, as a key function of uh, the, the Magic Leap. It's interesting that he's a clinical advisor to Magic Leap. Um, and again, you know, why? I can imagine that the, the, for, for A-level A -level biology students, yeah, maybe it's exciting, maybe they remember it. And it, it's all overdone because you can actually buy, you can actually buy this model. I, I don't, I'm not too sure why he's doing this. <laughs> But he's going back on. But anyway, that's another story. But you can buy this model, this transparent model, fully animated, off a site called TurboSquid, for about $120. You know, it, 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 it's all quite misleading that these companies say, "Look what we can do," and they'll charge you an arm and a leg, when actually you can probably end up doing a lot of it yourself. Uh, oh, this is lovely. All these Japanese. Uh, uh, is it seven? Seven Japanese, uh, seven Japanese individuals in an operating theater, all with magic leap, and they're all doing this. Look, they're all, they're all doing the, the, the gesture control. So, which magic leap is recognizing whose gestures? And you know, they're, they're all, they've obviously all got some this fantastic Star, Star Wars hologram in front of them. So, what's happening to the poor patient in the meantime? And, you know, and, and, and these things aren't particularly reliable at, at, at measuring your gestures anyway. Uh, so, again. All this barrier, all this barrier stuff is putting the, the, the barrier claims of Don Norman are, are evident yet again. Apart from the cheesy music, I lo I, I thank you for that. I, I, had, I just had to play that cheesy music. Um, this has got to be the worst human inter human interface I've ever ever come across. I mean, I'm sorry to the guys who actually developed this, but if you put on uh, a, a, either a VR or AR headset, I mean, just look look at the text, look at the look at the fine detail. You're never going to resolve that. You're never visually going to be able to resolve most of that inside a headset with the current you know, 2K, possibly 4K resolution. If you're lucky, it's simply not going to happen. And you've got all these different things that appear on your wrist that you have to interact with. Uh, and well, how that's intuitive, God only knows. That's all I can say. <coughs> um, oh, this is another good one. What's, what, what's the lady? What, what's what they're doing to this chap's knee? You know, look, look he's got, look, he's got no, no glove. It's like, oh, well, okay. So, so, how on earth are they doing that accurately? They're not because it's computer-generated imagery. It's video. It's, it's post-production video. Uh, but again, you know, this is supposed to be happening collaboratively. There are, exam there are reasonable examples of collaborative surgical training, very basic surgical training across the world, but that, sadly, is not one of them. So if you look online, that's the message, we're, that's the message people are taking home. The future is already here. You can put these headsets on, you can go into an operating theater, and you can improve the lot of the patient, less time, more accuracy, 
and the patient will leave a, a happy bunny. And I say all these examples, uh, and I've got a couple more just a little bit later on. So the future is already here, but, but is it? Is it really here? And if it is here, where's the evidence? And this is my big gripe. You know, where is the evidence? Where, where are all the ethics sort of applications? Where are all the MHRA clearances? We've got companies out there, for example, already claiming that their tools have been validated, that their tools have been accepted by the Royal College of Surgeons of England. What the heck? You know, who's, who's, doing, who's looking after simulation at the Royal College of Surgeons at the moment to take this company's product for which there exist two of the worst sort of valid, validation or validational papers I've ever seen in my life. If one of my students had produced that, they would have failed instantly. It's unbelievable. Um, you know, one of my co Manson, my colleague, and, and one of my other students uh, who's, who's looking into um, uh, uh, ultrasonic, ultrasonic simulation, have had to go through hell to hell and back just to get their, just to get their, uh, their, their experimental designs and their experimental systems through MHRA. But a lot of the companies that are out there aren't even bothering with this. But bothering with this, they, they, they go, they sponsor a conference at the Royal College of Surgeons, for example, and all of a sudden they talk to the right people, and bang, we've been approved, we've been accredited. And it's not the case. It's not the case at all. Is there any credible evidence? So Mansour, who's sitting down here, his, his current PhD is looking into the uh, the opportunities uh, afforded by mixed reality, that's blending the best of the real with the best of the virtual, uh, for rectal examinations. And he's just recently connected, conduct, conducted a systematic review of this area, which I thought was going to be really, really interesting, because finally it would help us pull out what evidence there might be out there. So he's carried out this study using the Medical Education Research Study Quality Instrument, and this is incredible. 807 articles he screened. 12 of those were found to be eligible, but only six scored greater than 50% of the maximum quality score based on the modified version of that, that, that quality instrument. Only six. And that's how it goes. Now, that's not good news. Uh, that's not good news at all. Um, but it's something we need to look at as a community. We need to start collecting papers. We need to start collecting evidence. Because as the, small, as the startup companies are involved in this go belly up, and they will, we're going to make sure, what we need to do is make sure that the, we don't see a rerun of what happened in the 1990s. In the 1990s, virtual reality took a major dip because of the lack of confidence that the, the so-called investors had, uh, had, uh, had put into, into buying these products. If you are on LinkedIn, there are two people I'd strongly suggest you keep track of. One is this guy. Um, he's in uh, Heidelberg, Heidelberg uh, Lars Reiderman, who's doing a fabulous job, fabulous job of, of collecting any form of credible evidence. He, he actually occasionally puts incredible evidence on LinkedIn because he knows it'll wind me up. But he, does, but he collects some fabulous papers, uh, and, and a lot of them are truly randomized studies. I mean, they, they, got, they, 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 they describe their participant sample, they do all the right evaluations, and, and, and so gradually we're building up this, this, this database. And the other guy to follow on LinkedIn is Tom, Tom Maddox, who's, who's become a good, good, uh, good friend and supporter of mine. And literally, day before yesterday, they produced something called the promise of virtual reality in healthcare uh, in five parts. It's not fantastic in terms of its depth, but nevertheless, it is a result of, of, of some really, really good research in pulling these, these documents together. We, need, we do need, we desperately need so much more of this, we really do, because it cannot go on any longer with all these products coming onto the market. Um, I just saw one this morning. Currently over in, in Florida, in Orlando, is the big defense ITSEC exhibition. And the number of surgical trainee, trainers that are over there um, being advertised on YouTube and being advertised on LinkedIn, again with computer-generated imagery and videos, is horrendous, absolutely horrendous. We need more of this. So this is what my little team does. We try to do distilling fact from fiction. I say, been doing this for 33 years. Um, the chances are, well, we, you, when people come to us, we have turned people away by saying you, you cannot use current generation VR, AR, or MR tech, whatever you want to call it, uh, in order to a, a, accomplish your task or to stand any chance of guaranteeing positive transfer from the virtual to the real. So our battle cry has always been humans first, technology second. Donald Norman, yes, if you get a chance to read Donald Norman's book, I think you can get one of his early editions for about 10 pence on Amazon. And, and it, it really is worth a read, if you can get it. The other thing that's worth a read, um, A, because it is totally relevant to what we do, and, and of course the, the problem is with these standards, they tend to be expensive, but if, you, if you're interested and you want to drop me a line, I, might, I might, probably shouldn't say this online, but if, if we're being streamed, but I, I can always slip you a copy, and I'll probably get some serious trouble for that, but ISO 9241 Part 210 is, is also our Bible. So we're taking all this experience that we've learned in, in human factors, and we're applying it 
to the, uh, this, this, this standard on human system interaction. The great thing about the standard is it's about that thin. And it's unlike most British standards or most international standards, it's very, very readable. Um, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this is what ISO 9241 is all about. It's everything that I've told you about, the lessons that we learned, understanding the context of use uh, by carrying out observations or more formal task analyses, using that to specify the, the, the user requirements. We need to look at the individuals. We need to look at the teams that they work in. We need to look at the organizations they work in. And we need to specify the, uh, what we call the target audience description, the TAD, or, and the knowledge, skills, and attitudes or attributes. We then do produce design solutions to meet those requirements, and then we go through a loop using simulation in our case to uh, evaluate the designs and then finally produce something that is worthy of going into operation and, and, and stands a really good chance of delivering the kind of uh, objective performance outcomes that we want. So those lessons that we've learned from the past from the NHS, the European Union, and indeed the Ministry of Defence uh, feeds what we call today our mixed reality developments, which is the, the, the final part of the talk. Um, and by mixed reality, as you'll see from the, 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 the uh, example I'll give you, is all about, it's not about headsets, as I've already said, it's about taking the best of the real, the real objects in the real world that are absolutely crucial to effective training, and using those to make the virtual more believable. And this will become, hopefully become a little bit clearer as we move into the, the examples. Uh, so, and we've applied this in, not only in, in, in healthcare, but in defense as well. So there's a, a mixed reality helicopter trainer on the far left, where we're using something that is akin to the side of the helicopter, the physical aspects of the helicopter, the, the opening of the door, the position of the safety handles, and so on. We've got the 20 millimeter gunnery system, which we put in place at HMS Collingwood many years ago. Again, these guys, the, these guys don't want to engage incoming targets using an Xbox controller. Because when they're on the ship, they're putting their weight into the weapon to slew it in azimuth and elevation. So if that's the case, use an inert deactivated weapon and, and then embed that within the virtual context. Minigun, exactly the same. Uh, and then we've got the cutlass uh, bomb disposal trainer where we've got a replica of the horrendously designed interface for cutlass. I mean, we didn't design it. It's got six joysticks. Each joystick does something different depending on which camera view you selected. Unbelievable. That's another story. But we had to replicate that because that's what the armed forces were given. That's what mixed reality is about, blending the real with the virtual. And so to finish off, just to show you how we're trying, I'm, I'm, we, haven't, we haven't got it right, we haven't got it 100% right. You know, we say nobody's perfect, but we have tried to use this in our the design of something we call the, the mixed reality MERT, Medical Emergency Response Team Trainer Project, which has been going for the last, um, last three years or so. So medical emergency response teams, these are the, the, the young guys and gals who get sent out, typically in a Chinook helicopter, but, but on other platforms as well, and they go out to carry to evacuate casualties from the, uh, the scene of uh, the scene of an incursion and preserve their life until they can get them back into the more um, the more well-equipped hospitals uh, back in places like Bastion, for example, when we were when we were over in the in, in, the, in the Middle East. The Merch Challenge that they said this is sponsored by the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine, um, which actually shares the same site as the University of Birmingham, which is incredibly convenient. And their question to us was. Can virtual reality or associated technologies deliver an affordable small team, three people, dynamic exposure, context exposure training? It's not clinical. We're not doing clinical training. Hence, the mannequins we're using are not functional. They're kind of functional, but they're not wholly functional. Uh, so it's not encompassing basic or advanced clinical skills. A more transportable solution than that currently in use. Top left-hand corner, £100,000 for that wooden box which is supposed to look like the inside of a Chinook helicopter, and, it, and it's, it's horrendous. You can't move it. Uh, the, the, the mannequins, they've got very early Simman mannequins that are falling to bits. I mean, not because they're, they're representing trauma, but because they are falling to bits. Uh, we've got uh, and a reconfigurable trainer, importantly, capable of being able to change from a Chinook to another platform, such as a hovercraft or a landing craft or, or, or a military vehicle. And also, as important, is a solution that attends to the needs of the instructor, not just the trainees. Because that's something, again, that simulation-based developers tend not to do very well. They forget the instructor, but we need to be able to give them something where they can do an after-action review and debrief once the trainees have got through their, um, got through their steps, their, their, their training. So we started off with a series of observations with colleagues at uh, Royal Air Force Bryce Norton, the Tactical Medical Wing, and Royal Air Force Odium. And again, just getting briefings from these guys, watching them do their thing in this, little, in, in this trainer. And just like the original Mister, we came up with a whole number of, of tasks and context and task constraints and so on, which defined the way we were going to design this trainer. 
Now, this is the mixed reality concept day one. Down at the bottom is a virtual reality Chinook that I'm moving around. Look what's happening. In most virtual reality, even with the best of collision detection and simulation, it's quite possible that you can stick your head through the wall of a Chinook. Or worst case, you can go into the cockpit, and you walk through the cockpit. And you know, as, as, if you, as, as, if you, as if the whole thing's invisible, transparent. That's not good enough. These guys are working in very constrained conditions where they don't want to be distracted by their elbows going through, through virtual objects. So we decided that this time what we would do is we would, we would build an, a simple inflatable enclosure, which is about the same width and the same height as a Chinook helicopter, roughly. And we would then carry out the virtual reality experience inside, inside, that, uh, in, inside that enclosure, with the aim being that, the, that the, the, the trainees would feel constrained, physically constrained, even though they were wearing headsets. So the, Mert, the mixed reality simulators, we called it, again, what we were trying to do was, was bring this, the, the virtual and the real together closely, uh, has the physical element. So you see the inside of the first, the, the, the first, um, the first enclosure, we've got, yeah, we've, got, we, we've got stuff from all over the place. There's an M60 machine gun there we got from a gift shop in Bobby Tracy in Devon, would you believe? Don't, don't ask. We've got a minigun sticking out the side, which we got from www.mrminigun.com in the States for about 120 quid. And we had to get the police to help us get, import it into the UK. That was hilarious. And we've got this trauma. We use a, uh, we've been using this trauma FX um, sim body, uh, which we affectionately call Steve the Stiff. Um, who is accurate in every detail, um, but you can actually strap things onto him, like, for example, you can strap on a, a blown-off leg, you can put machete wounds, gunshot wounds, and so on. And you can see the, some of the, the designs of the, of the instructor's console. So the idea was you put the headset on, and you would find yourself inside a virtual Chinook, and with a little bit of luck, as you reached out to touch the virtual, the virtual uh, mannequin, your virtual hand would correspond to the position of the physical mannequin, and you get a bit of haptics. So we weren't, we weren't planning on using these haptic feedback gloves. Uh, didn't work. I'll come on to that in a second. Didn't work. We were, it, in fact, it worked really badly. The virtual reality elements you can see here. Again, you know, uh, what? Twenty dollars for a minigun. Seventy dollars for an animated um, British soldier. A lot of this stuff can be bought off the web. There's no, there's no need to expend huge amounts of money building these things from scratch because they exist. And even though there's a lot of American models on the, on, on the web, you can, still, you can still modify them to make them more representative of, of, of uh, the British Armed Forces. Flying effects, there's no motion base on this. Most, the, the, the jury's out on using motion bases to create the illusion of motion. Uh, so we decided to stick with visual cues. And what we do is we have this billboard effect where we have a screen outside the side windows a virtual screen outside the side windows and right towards the back of the ramp. And what we do is we project on that screen, bottom left-hand corner is us flying one of our drones backwards over a very bar barren part of Dartmoor, uh, Fox Mire, just south of Princeton. And it works. It works really, really well. Obviously, you can't get too close because as soon as you get too close, you can see the edges of this virtual screen. But in terms of creating peripherally a cue that you're moving or the helicopter's turning, it, it, it's not bad. And we've had quite a few, few um, ex uh, or veterans comment on it, it, it was, it's quite a good illusion. But, as you can see from this, same problem exists. So as I put down my disembodied hands, either using a glove or HTC Vive hand controllers, you can see they're jittering around and they disappear into the body. So at some stage, if, if I go a bit lower, I will feel them, I will feel them, won't I? So we had people coming to us and saying, well, you, you know, you're using a virtual reality headset. Why don't you use an augmented reality headset like HoloLens or Leap, Magic Leap? Now, uh, what about these haptic feedback gloves? You know, this, 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 this new glove that you see time and time again on LinkedIn called the Haptex, which is, I mean, I invented, the, believe it or not, I invented the world's first haptic feedback glove back in 1990, which is pneumatically controlled, as indeed is the Haptex. It doesn't work. It simply doesn't work for the kind of, uh, the, the fidelity of touch that you need for these guys. Here's a good example of the Haptex in use for a medical, pro a me medical project. I've blanked out the company's names to protect the guilty. But what's, it, what, what's what this guy's doing with his, with his was it £40,000 plus glove? He's, he's prodding the hole with a finger. And most of the time, he's standing there, with it, and he's using, he's using the Phantom, the new version of the Phantom controller, and he's standing there with this god-awful heavy glove on his right hand, doing nothing. And that, you know, he spent all that money, whereas most of the activities are probably, are probably being performed by his non-dominant hand using, the, using the, uh, the, 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 the Phantom haptic feedback system. Headsets, AR headsets, I'm sorry, but they are still many, many years away from a believable, credible wearable solution that will be used in operating theaters. Again, here you see lovely examples of, of video being used to indicate what the 
that the vendors would hope that you would see, or want you to, want you to believe you'll see. Top right hand corner is something that Vish, my colleague Vish and I did a little while ago with the Dream Glass augmented reality headset, where we wanted to see the, um, the Mayflower, which of course next year is the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower sailing to the New World, sailing out of Plymouth. Now, I managed to get a view, I don't know if you can see that in the bottom, but that's the view outside of the Mayflower in Catdown, just around the corner from Plymouth Barbican. It's, I mean, it's not even ghost-like, it's not even Marie Celeste. Some of you at the back may not even be able to see it, but that's, that's how bad a lot of these things are. They're fine if you want to put up things like symbols or high contrast alphanumerics and, and maybe even video patches, but when it comes to doing something that's, that, that looks realistic and blends with the real world, it's not gonna happen, not gonna happen for a while. So, Again, deep breath, stood back, thought, okay, how are we gonna do this? So we started, we, we had this idea of trying to use this, this mixed reality idea where somehow we could see the physical objects that matter inside a virtual reality context with all the sound effects, all the visual effects to create the illusion that you were in flight or you were under attack. So we're using this blue screen approach. And what you can see here is uh, one of our military visitors coming along and having a go at uh, inside the original enclosure. And what he was seeing with this blue screen effect is the real mannequin on the real stretcher, but he can also see his real hands, which means that when he, when he, when he looks up, he's inside, in this case, um, a landing craft, I think it is, or it's a hovercraft, doesn't matter. But when he, when, he, when he reaches out with his hand, he picks up the real physical, real physical mannequin. And so there's no lag, there's, there's absolutely no sort of discontinuity between your virtual hand and your real hand. Um, that's what we've decided to go with. And what we're using is that we're using a modified virtual reality headset, HTC Vive headset, with a single, not stereoscopic, a single Zymia industrial camera, which gives us a nice 70 degrees field of view uh, of both the virtual and of the, of the, of the, uh, and the real. So here we have uh, two guys in the original enclosure. Um, this, this video blew us away, because what these guys are doing is they're about to candulate the, uh, the, 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 um, the mannequin. They're exchanging needles. So you see they're both wearing these headsets. They're, they're talking to each other, they're interacting naturally, they're exchanging needles, and what they, what they can see at all times is they see the, real, the real mannequin and all the real kit to go with it, the real kit that actually matches, and, but they're inside, they're inside a Chinook in flight, and that works really well, works really well as well. Um, we expanded the, uh, the enclosure in, in, back in June 2018, so you can see here, we've got these little um, cuboid things that we put in, again, to, 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 to create an illusion of space. So all that clutter, all the mini guns, all the bits and pieces is gone, and so all we've got now is every, everything that's around the guy uh, is being is being done is being done done virtu virtually, but through this camera modified pass through camera modified um, uh, sort of virtual reality headset. And again, in terms of crew member avatar, we've also generated we've been using motion capture. Just we don't want to put too much of this in because what we want to do is we want to make sure that these guys aren't just standing still like those nurses were in that operating theater doing nothing and therefore being distraction, distracting through inactivity. But we don't want them to be frenetic either. So we've got the second casualty team that comes on whilst you're performing on the physical mannequin, all these kind of things going on in the background. The support, uh, the armed forces at the back will come in, just sit down, occasionally look in your direction, look as if they're interacting with each other, and then the helicopter takes off. So again, it's, it's, it's neither static nor, nor frenetic and distracting, and that's, that's absolutely crucial. And as for changing the platforms, we've been able to do that as well, and literally at the, at, at the touch of a button. And we're talking to air ambulances and, and, and ambulance and, and ground ambulance teams. So you've got the Chinook. Um, and one of the great things about our job is that Vish and I get to do really crazy things. Like we, they, we get to fly in Chinook helicopters and we get to fly it, we get to go in Mastiffs. The, the, the video is a little bit, um, bit, bit squashed in this, but you get the idea. So there's a Mastiff in the Mastiff interior. There's a, a film taken by Vish and I uh, going out on a Royal Marines landing craft where we have uh, GoPro cameras strapped to the port and starboard and a 360 camera forward, and we're capturing all the imagery and the sounds as this thing is proceeding so we can use that billboarding effect in order to create the illusion of movement. And finally, it was my favorite trip of all time was to go out on this uh, Royal Marines landing craft, and, and that was just awesome. But again, GoPros either side, 360 at the front, and then we, we get access to the sounds, we get access to the interior, so we can build the interior. And we've got more of these, we got, we got more of these, 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 these platforms actually planned. Version three of the enclosure we showed at DSCI 2019 in Excel a couple of months ago. Um, you can see the, uh, the instructor's console here. Views of what the guys, up to three guys are seeing in the headsets. Views are from closed circuit TVs in. We've got a mock-up, uh, a virtual mock-up of the Tempest Pro life science monitor, which we can control from the instructor's console. And you can pre-program a whole series of tasks 
uh, inside the inside the, uh, the the virtual Chinook, everything from night vision to to being attacked by small arms uh, to dust coming in the cabin and and so on and so forth. And you know, at the moment, uh, we're, we're fingers crossed because we're hopefully within any, any day now we'll hear whether or not we've received phase three of this contract to actually take it out and carry out evaluations. Yay, we get to get carry out evaluations and try and see if we can demonstrate some degree of transfer from, from the, the virtual or the mixed reality to the real. So the conclusions then, VR, AR, MR, huge opportunity. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dissing any of these technologies because they are absolutely fantastic. I mean, they kept me going for the last you know, more than 30 years in a career, and they've got a lot to offer in all kinds of applications, including healthcare. But I'm afraid it's not, you know, in my opinion, it's not one VR or AR headset that's, that's available that's totally fit for purpose in safety critical healthcare applications at the moment. That's my opinion. Okay, sorry if that upsets anyone, but that's the case. And it's not all about headsets and all other outlandish wearable technology. And sometimes you have to stand back and say, yeah, it's great for PR if I've got this guy in a headset, but is that going to deliver the training that this guy needs? Or can I do it on a 4K screen? Or can I do it on a projector? It's, it's not all about headsets. Haptic feedback systems, again, incredibly immature uh, to be used reliably uh, and safely in any form of medical training, period. I just, just wouldn't go there, especially surgery. Effective training does not require achieving the greatest degree of realism. We've shown that with the MIST project. Yes, we, we are trying to induce certain degrees of realism now, but even so, the Chinook itself isn't what I would call high fidelity. It doesn't have to be. We don't want to, put the, we don't want to adopt that games, tech games company uh, attitude of putting in everything because we can. It's not necessary. Yes, ex exercise extreme caution when you're considering investing in VR and AR because there are a lot of hungry and soon to collapse startups out there, I'm afraid, who have got significant investments uh, based on, I would imagine, these crazy market surveys that are coming in are saying that this, this, this market will be worth trillions come 2020, 20, 2025. I've never believed them, uh, and I've never will, but you have, to be, you, have, you have to be clear in your mind what you want the technology to do, and make sure they show you the product, not just the videos. That's, more, that's seriously important. Do not believe everything you see online. I, I probably said that enough times. To, to people start throwing things at me at the moment and question the motivation, integrity, and track record of those who typically overhype their products. And finally, not last but not least, human-centered design. ISO 9210, um, part 210, at the very least, is absolutely essential to at least make an attempt to get this right. Those are the conclusions. We're applying them even today uh, with some of the other projects, not, not surgical-related projects, but other projects that we're doing. So we've been doing work, for example, with, uh, using uh, virtual scenes of nature, uh, for uh, hospital trials with military amputees. Um, and uh, this is, uh, again, Vish, who is graduating with his PhD this very month, I'm pleased to say, uh, has been looking at that um, not only in terms of introducing this technology into intensive care units, as we see here with this lady, where we were carrying out a study with an um, anaesthetist uh, looking at the impact of virtual scenes of nature on sleep quality, but also rehabilitation. Uh, and rehabilitation is so exactly the same virtual world Wembry, which is the coastline just around the corner from Plymouth. Um, and this guy, this guy who, who sadly passed away uh, not that long after, but you can see his wife, you can see the face of his wife taking pictures of this guy, um, Nick, at Tor Bay Hospital, with whom we work really, really closely. He's got one of these manual motor meds, and you can see, we couldn't, we couldn't have predicted that. On, on, his ward, on his ward wall was him in, a, sort of in a, uh, a, a tricycle on a beach, which is exactly what he was doing inside the, uh, inside the, um, the virtual, virtual uh, scene. Again, no headset, just a screen. Headsets in ICU, headsets in, in, in non-starter at the moment, just, they're just from a hygiene perspective. Um, thank you. I've got, to put the, I've got to put the music on for this, because people go, ah. This just goes to show what students who come to us with no experience in virtual reality or 3D at all can actually do. So this is something that one of our Chinese students put together called Candyland, which is designed to potentially, in the future, again with our friends at Torbay, use as a distractor for kids undergoing injections or bandage change after, after a burn. And they have to go through this Candyland and they have to feed the unicorns and the little fairies fly around. And you've got the Willy Wonka theme tune in the background. And at the end, you get, you get a trip, you get a reward of a trip over, a, over, the, over the rainbow, which is, it's really cute. Um, my, my, uh, my, wife, my wife loves this because uh, she's a special needs teacher as well. Um, and another thing, this is Elsa, my MSc student from uh, about 18 months ago, built this um, scene of, uh, this mounting scene using assets bought off the web, 
No experience in VR, no experience in 3D. Did this within three months. It was so successful, we even got David Attenborough to do the narration, the actual the, the re relaxation narration for her project, which as you can imagine, absolutely blew her away. But again, there's an awful lot out there that people who are interested in this don't have to spend megabucks on. You, know, you can actually go out there, and with a little bit of effort, you can actually do it yourself. And future projects, you know, next week, uh, we'll be talking about a new project looking at a, um, a mobile mixed reality care in the community trainer for nurses, uh, for nurses in the Southwest Peninsula. So again, that will all be the focus of a human-centered design project. So I hope that's been informative. Uh, I've got seven seconds left according to my clock. So what I want to do is say, I hope you enjoyed that. And hope uh, it's counting down. Uh, um, and, uh, and I do hope you enjoyed that. And I haven't actually offended anybody. And, 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 and uh, if, if you want to follow my, my, my rants and raves on LinkedIn, you're more than welcome to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much. I'd like to um, well, thank you for that wonderful talk, Bob. That, uh, I certainly think it's kind of put some of my ideas into perspective. And it's, I think we all sometimes look around us and we think, that looks wonderful. And then we're sorely disappointed when we find there isn't an application or that we've been told that something's going to be there in video and it actually doesn't appear in front of you. And so I think that's really nice for us to have this grounding, I think, you've given us in um, a critique, being able to critique the, the, uh, the nature of the environment. Does anyone have any questions for Bob? Any questions at all? Good. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, anyone? No. <laughs> right, well, that's wonderful. I think, I think we, won't, we won't force questions. I think Bob would probably prefer to have a coffee or a tea. Coffee with you. <laughs> coffee. Thank you very much again, Bob, for, for that wonderful thank, talk. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Kieran Feeney. Um, Kieran's probably quite well known to many people. He's been around simulation for a number of years and it's really exciting. Currently he's our, our European lead for all things patient simulation but he's about to change roles soon. I won't say too much about that but he, um, so we, you will be seeing a lot more of him. So Kieran over to you for the next bit. This is really complicated so that's why we've got Kieran.